Hey, City of Champions. I hope you're all having an awesome week. I'm super pumped that we finally got some warm weather out there. Hopefully, you guys are all enjoying it. My guest this week is a man by the name of John Bricks, and he's traveled an unusually interesting path in life. John's a former Calgary police officer who retired from the force after 13 years, and now he works as the West Coast Regional Safety Manager for Google. Weird, right? He also travels the continent speaking publicly on a wide range of topics like leadership, PTSD awareness, risk management, just to name a few. John's a crazy unique guy and uh, he's got some incredible life experiences that I was lucky enough to have him share with me. So I hope you enjoy the wise words of John Bricks. Sitting here today with John Bricks, a man of many talents um, and uh, many jobs, it sounds like. Uh, I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you for having me. So first question, because I'm curious, how did you come across the podcast? Uh, through LinkedIn, actually. So uh, one of my LinkedIn uh, connections posted the podcast. Mm -hmm. and I listened to a few of them because I really enjoy listening to podcasts and then decided to reach out. I appreciate that. That's perfect. And it's such an important part of the podcast for me is getting to meet new people and, and exposing myself to parts of the world that otherwise you'd never come in contact to. Yeah. I have to thank Trevor Lampson online here because he was the one who recommended I start posting them on LinkedIn. So good on him. Do you know Trevor? Uh, no, I don't. No? Okay. No. He's... He's a good guy. He's in Edmonton here. Uh, so just for context, let's start with a little bit of who you are and what you do, and then we're going to dive right deep into the story. Perfect. Uh, so I'll start from present day and work back. Uh, presently, I work for Google on their health and safety construction side, and a lot of people think Googlers are... All just uh, IT guy sitting behind the computer. You do not look like a fucking IT yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've been told lots of times that I don't look like a Google. <laughs> um, but all the campuses, all the data centers, everything like that, that all has to be built. Right. Uh, so there's billions of dollars worth of, of construction happening worldwide. So I look after, well, I, when I first started with Google, I looked after all, all their South American projects. Mm -hmm. So uh, Chile, Brazil, and Peru. Um, once those got dialed in, I was asked if I wanted to manage the West Coast. And uh, so I had a choice whether to be in Chile or or California, and I took California. Interesting. Okay, fair yeah. enough. What was the, what was the main factor in, in uh, that decision? Um, just the projects, to be honest with you. The, the, right now in California, in the Bay Area, just outside of San Francisco, mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. Uh, Google has their mega projects going on. So we're building structures that have never been built before, and they're going to be completely unique at the end of the day. So I just wanted to be involved in that and in the future be able to look at it and be like, yeah. I was part of that. Of course. Can you tell us about any of them? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's top secret at this point? really top secret. But I, they're really cool, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they'll be done in two years. So at that point, uh, everybody will know what they look like and, yeah. and what they're... All right, so let's back up a lot and let's talk about the origin story a little bit, who you are, where you came from, and, and how's that led you to now overseeing these top secret missions for Google? Um, well, I basically was raised in Edmonton, and then in 1999, I uh, was hired by the Calgary Police Service. Yeah. And then I did a total of almost 15 years with the police service in Calgary. I, I reached what I perceived was the pinnacle of my career. Mm -hmm. I had a bucket list of things that I wanted to do, and just through determination, hard work, some mm -hmm. luck, uh, I went through and I hit all the specialty units that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so at that mark, it was roughly the 12 year mark inside the service. I knew I wasn't that happy with the job anymore because it was oddly enough getting boring. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at older uh, mentors that were getting ready to retire and seeing them, I was like, mm, you know what? I don't want to hang out for another 10 years right. to get full pension. Right. I'm going to start making some changes to transition out of this career, right. um, which is an anomaly. Most officers, as soon as they break their their 13 year mark, mm -hmm. um, will be lifers. You get pot committed at that yeah, point, right? Yeah, so they're just like, oh, my on. pension's in. I'm just yeah. going to hang on, right? Yeah. So let's. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop you a little bit there, but. Tell, tell us about what was uh, what Edmonton was like growing up. Like, were you into sports? Like, did you you know? Uh, how did you look at this city? Were you one of the guys that wanted to get out of this city? 
Um, no, uh, to be honest with you, after living in Edmonton and living in Calgary, mm-hmm. I like Edmonton a lot more. Is Does Calgary have the mountains and all that close? Sure. Sure. Uh, but the culture in Edmonton, I really like. Edmonton is still more down to earth. Um, the, the the restaurants are unique. Every you know the coffee shops are really cool here. The culture's awesome. Whereas if you go to Calgary, it's very corporate. Yeah. So everybody just wants a Moxie's and an Earl's. Right. Nobody wants anything unique there. And I, I get it. That's part of the culture. But I truly do like Edmonton a lot more. So what made you go to Calgary with the police service? Was I applied at Edmonton and Calgary at the same time. Yeah. And then Calgary was the first one that yeah. through, the, through the application process that said, come okay. on over. Fair enough. Were you a big Oilers fan growing up? Uh, yeah, pretty good. I mean, um, <coughs> I'm not a... I know some people that are diehard fans. Yeah. And so if you want to say fan, yeah, absolutely. Like, did you know, did I watch the games? Did I enjoy them? Sure. Was I the guy that collect jerseys and fill my basement yeah. up with it? No. How old were you during the Dynasty era? Like, as they were winning Cups, 80, 84, 85? Oh, that would have been like 10, 10 to 12 years old. Okay. So. Yeah. So you remember, like, all the all the pomp and circumstance, but yeah. you were kind of still a little young for still that. Still young for Okay, that. fair enough. And then um, I want to talk briefly about the book that you wrote, fictional book about some of the um, some of the events. Well, you can tell us what the book's about. Yeah, the book is called The Wolf and Sheepdog. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's actually written under a pen name of Joseph Smith. Um, and it's just a collection of short stories. It, the The stories are fictional, and but I use my experiences of like what it's like to work night shift, mm-hmm. uh, what it's like to get big adrenaline dumps, and that I use that as a foundation to build these stories up. Um, I write in first person narratives, so the reader gets to see it directly through the eyes and emotions of the character that I created. Right. So, what compelled you to write? Like, wh- were you always a writer growing up? Yeah, I was. I mean, I have a avid reader, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't like to be bored. Mm-hmm. So I have just finished some books, uh, like, uh, which ones was it? It was Jarhead, A Million Little Pieces, and uh, A Soldier Goes to War. Yeah, so those are all heavy. All heavy books, but they're all first-person narrative. Yeah. Uh, and then at that point, I was like, hey, I'm just going to give this a try, see how it goes. That's incredible. You just decided to jump into it because yeah. that's a big task from what I understand yeah and it became quite an obsession it only took me six months to do like 600 pages so you had a lot of content to draw on <laughs> yeah and it was it was fun and it was uh, was really for me it just felt good to write so mm-hmm. if there's anyone out there that has ever thought they should write a book just write it yeah. even if it doesn't get published it's still really good to write it right well, they, I think it's important for, for us to constitute our thoughts and our beliefs, right? Either by writing or by talking. Yeah. And a lot of the times you, you can think this sort of nebulous concept of, of ideas and then you write it down or you tell someone and you're like, oh, okay, that doesn't actually make sense. 100%. Yeah, yeah. But we get like caught up in thinking like, oh, I've got this great idea and you think about it for months or years and then, and then you're like, oh, that was actually shit. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Um, so what was the reception of the book like? Uh, you know what? It was actually really good. The civilian world it really enjoyed it. Um, there was some hiccups along the way when people perceived that they were actually real documented stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it, obviously it's not that. Uh, but so far, sold I think almost thirty thousand books. That's unbelievable. Yeah, so not bad for you know little Canadian author. Right? So. <laughs> what are some of the comments you've got from people who had no experience with policing before? Um, they didn't realize what the world was like when the lights shut off. Mm-hmm. Um, because we do get a really sanitized view of what that job is about and, or a glorified view. So through television and that, we think that, yeah, you have these great calls Mm-hmm. Uh, high speed chases, shootouts, and then at the end of the day, everyone just dusts themselves off and they're off to the right. races. <laughs> Bad guys in handcuffs. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, where in all reality, we'd always say on the service that the job is 98% boredom, mm-hmm. but 2% sheer excitement. And that sh- sheer excitement <laughs> creates that 98% boredom because you have a lot of work to do after, after right. those type of calls. Um, what's, uh, what's your take on the Toronto incident that just happened and the officer, how he handled that? Uh, is this the one with the van? Yeah, the van and then the officer who didn't shoot. Yeah, and, and I never critique anyone on their what they did or what they didn't do. Um, I would always say 
that you have two choices. You can do something or you can do nothing. And the fact that he still got involved uh, with it is is fine with me because there's it gets dynamic. So speaking from the law enforcement side, mm-hmm. if you do shoot at somebody that's operating a vehicle, it's not going to stop the vehicle. Right. It's it's not like the movies where you hit the tire and the tire blows out and the vehicle stops, <laughs> especially when you're dealing with a handgun round. Mm-hmm. So he had a tenth of a second to make a decision. Mm-hmm. He made the decision. And at the end of the day, because he, he made a decision, um, I think it was the right one. Wait, did you see the video of when the guy got out of the van? No. no. Oh, so the guy gets out of the van, and the officer is not behind his vehicle for cover. Yeah. And he's standing out in the open with his gun drawn saying, get on the ground, get on the ground. And the guy's pretend, he's holding something, he pretends he has a gun. And then not only that, but he's reaching for his hip, and the officer continues not to shoot at him. Yeah. And the police chief of Toronto came out and, and praised him and said, you know, we're used to, or we're, we're, um, we preach to use minimum force required. Yeah. But I had a friend on the force tell me that's not true at all. What's actually priest is using the least amount of reasonable force. Yeah. And if you're in a standoff with someone, first of all, not protecting yourself behind your vehicle and you're face, you know, you're 20 feet from the guy and you can't tell if he's actually got a gun, you're much, it's much better to be safe and pull the trigger than it is to chance him hurting yourself or other people. Yeah. And especially reaching for that holster. He's like, no, they should have lit him up at that point. Yeah. And I think what a lot of people don't understand is that there is a phenomenon out there called suicide by cop. Right. So these, uh, I'll use the term bad guys, uh, that are unstable what they're trying to do is instigate uh, police officers shooting them mm-hmm. because for whatever reason they don't want to commit their own suicide but they would they all they know that police officers are trained mm-hmm. and we have the tools um, so they really push that envelope um, so yeah as far as the officer not shooting um, who knows he could have uh, been able to see clearly what the guys in his hands are right uh, there's a bunch of mitigating circumstances do I think that he could have moved to cover Sure. Yeah. But at that point in time, he probably had a huge adrenaline dump. His heart rate's 220, and yeah. he's making those decisions on the fly. So, What's it like? What's it feel like? I mean, there's all sorts of different dramatizations in films about, you know, bullet time or yeah. things narrowing. But, like, what's your best description of a real adrenaline-packed situation like that? You know what? When you do get such a heavy adrenaline dump, uh, so that, that idea of fight or flight, like mm-hmm. the you know, the, your brain does the math and there's imminent danger happening. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, my biggest effect is uh, time distortion. And the reason behind it is when you get a big uh, stress uh, trigger, your body releases adrenaline and epinephrine, mm-hmm. two heavy stimulants. Right. And because your brain is so stimulated at that point, time is not slowing down, but the amount of information your brain can process increases so if we go from processing five megabytes of data a second when we get our adrenaline dump we're processing 20 to 30 megabytes per second right which makes us feel slow just because of the how quick our brain is working so that's one of the first things that happens to me is i notice a huge time distortion Mm -hmm. um i i the easiest way to understand it is is matrix time off the movie the matrix right it truly does feel like that. The, the, the world becomes quiet. Um, things slow down dramatically. And then once the threat is gone, then it picks up speed and mm-hmm. gets back to normal. But even in the beginning of my career, not understanding what adrenaline did, uh, for the first few times I was responding to calls, I felt like I was behind. Mm-hmm. That I wasn't reacting fast enough. And then a, a good mentor of mine, when I went to talk to him, I was like, hey, you know what? I feel bad. I'm, I think I'm shitting the bed, yeah. right? Like, I feel like I'm always late. And he's like, has your officer coach said anything? I'm like, no, no. He jokes that I'm always there. Yeah. And then he's like, oh, you know what? You're suffering time distortion because of adrenaline, yeah. which is totally fine. And then it alleviated that uh, that sense of guilt I felt, right? And yeah. I understood, like, no, my body's just super fu- super performing at that point right how do they train for that like how do you prepare for for that adrenaline um and those scenarios well through training we will get uh our heart rates up yeah so we'll put a heart rate monitor on us um and then at that point you want to work at getting your heart rate up but really at the end of the day there's nothing 
you right. can do to, to get you ready for experience, it. Experience. Yeah, yeah you got to experience it. And your body gets inoculated to it really quick. The first time, if you're brand new recruit, the first time you do a traffic stop, mm -hmm. you're getting an adrenaline dump. Your hands are shaking, your heart rate's up because this is so new for you. Yeah. Um, but then your next traffic stop mm -hmm. is less. And then finally, a year into it, it's casual. It's another thing. So then it's the same thing. The first time you take a call with a guy... Um, suicidal male running down the street mm -hmm. when you're going to it's a really high stimulus right. uh, years later you're going there chilled out yeah. so it's that whole idea of, of getting inoculated to it it's one of those weird circumstances too where like your natural reaction which is like panic and adrenaline and, and overstimulation probably makes every situation worse yeah absolutely and it's it's funny because the the my knowledge of how my body reacts under stress has helped me in my presenting and keynote speaking world. Right. Uh, because a lot of people look at presenting as the second most stressor. First one is only death. Right. <laughs> so, which, which is peculiar, right? Where people be like, oh, the only thing I would like that would he, be worse than presenting yeah. is dying. Yeah, exactly. Seinfeld um, had a joke about that. And I think he thought it was the other way around, that people's number one fear is public speaking. Yeah. Number two is that. So he's like, if you're at a funeral, you'd rather be in a coffin than giving the eulogy. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so even when I speak now, and I do it on a regular basis, but there's occasionally where I can tell my speech is accelerating, my breathing starts to get different. And as soon as that happens, I recognize I'm like, oh, I'm getting mm -hmm. a stress response. Mm -hmm. And then you just take a nice deep breath. Uh and you slow your body right down. Right. Uh, so getting inoculated to adrenaline through the police service, definitely when I started public speaking, everyone's like, you know, the, the, doesn't that terrify you? It would terrify me. And I'm like, well, I had those moments, uh, but I, I know where I'm going right. and I know how to stop it now. Right. Yeah. So I want to talk about the public speaking, but a quick question about the policing too is like how much of the training is, is tactical versus almost like philosophical because I imagine like like I know you do a talk on PTSD as well yeah. right and and I th from my knowledge or my reading and research that's just casually done is that PTSD is is usually occurring in people who have been forced to do bad things it's not witnessing bad things but it's when you realize what you're actually capable of and and that's very disconcerting and 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 traumatizing to people yeah from uh, the training and that that I've gotten, generally when law enforcement or fire, or EMS, or military, mm -hmm. a lot of people, the moment that you have a moment of helplessness, so you feel like you were no longer winning, you weren't in control, mm -hmm. or you just simply couldn't help your friend, mm -hmm. those are the people that generally suffer an increased level of PTSD. Right. Um, my professional opinion from being on the police service, uh, the job has trauma to it yeah. because of what we see. Yeah. So we all suffer post-traumatic stress. A anyone does. If you drive by a bad vehicle accident and you see that body there, uh, people will suffer the post-traumatic stress. If you don't know how to manage that stress and deal with it, that's where it becomes a disorder. Right. And so the idea of, of People moving forward through their post-traumatic stress is the first thing is, A, accept the fact that you have post-traumatic stress. It's it's a normal human reaction to a very abnormal situation. Right. So uh, destigmatizing it. Destigmatizing it, exactly. And then understanding that the simple act of communication mm -hmm. is what will help you as well as understanding. Because if you look at it one way, I was talking about feeling ashamed because I felt I was slow to the calls. Mm -hmm. Um, if I would have not talked to my mentor, that could have turned into post-traumatic stress where that shame would have escalated through my career. Yeah. But instead I talked to my mentor and he's like, no, you're doing just fine. Right. Um, I've had some great mentors, even took a call, uh, as a recruit, you know, um, afterwards I was shaking mm -hmm. and I was trying to write in my notebook and I was, but then I went into my cruiser to hide the fact that I was shaking because mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, I don't want to seem like I'm a coward. Yeah. You've got to maintain that, that, that image, outward yeah. image, right? And so my officer coach came in and he saw that I was trying to write and then, yeah, he normalized it. He mm -hmm. was like, Hey, you know what? That's just adrenaline burning out of your system. Yeah. Put the book down, wait five minutes. You'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, you did a good job. Yeah. So just doing that mitigated a lot of possible post-traumatic stress out of the call. Right. And uh, so it's the idea of, of um, yeah, you go through your career 
hopefully with the right mentors to to learn how to manage what you see right and learn in a situation and like fail but micro failures not exactly. not drastic failures yeah. where yeah. you're on the hook for uh, for a life or something yeah, like that exactly right? so what uh, what drove you to start public speaking because again like that's it's terrifying for most people but again you probably get like desensitized to a lot of like traumatic stuff going yeah. through policing so I had to manage some PTSD issues once I left the service mm-hmm. um, so it was actually a good friend of mine uh, he suffers PTSD also but he's a paramedic mm-hmm. um, we started chatting about our experiences and he public speaks a lot and he actually holds uh, it's called helping the helpers and it's in Nova Scotia he holds a, a yearly form seminar so He's got a gift. I don't know what he does, but at the end of it, I walked away and I'm like, did I just agree to speak in front of a whole bunch of people? <laughs> um, and, and there's lots of people he's gotten to speak that say the same thing. His yeah. name is John also. And they're just like, man, we don't know what's up with John, but he gets us to speak. Right. So I started public speaking there. Um, and I did a lot of public speaking, uh, technically in the service training recruits. Mm-hmm. And then in oil and gas delivering messages and all that, but never in that type of form. Mm -hmm. Going there and speaking about it, uh, I went there with the goal of just simply, if I can just help one other person, this is golden. And it was stressful, of course, Mm because you're really opening yourself up to the crowd. And I know your your listeners can't see it, but I'm not a small dude. Mm -hmm. So uh, the message was actually stronger because of the fact, you know, I'm a big guy. I got lots of tattoos, and I was willing to stand in a lot of, in front of people. And be like, "Yeah, hey, I experienced trauma in the job. I didn't know how to manage it, mm-hmm. and it just simply escalated to a certain point. And then going into the real world, if you want to call it that, I had to learn how to deal with it. Right. right. Well, I mean, I think um, I think that vulnerability in life is really really powerful. Like, it's yeah. a great way to build relationships. It's a great way to disarm people who are who are aggravated or aggressive towards you. Like you just basically say like, no, like, look, this is what I'm feeling and thinking. And like, and it's also a great way to connect the ends, right? Because so much of conflict seems to be people, you know, just misunderstanding each other consistently. And if you're like, all right, let's start with what I see this as. And there's my insecurities about it. And then let's hear yours. And maybe we can connect the two here. And a lot of times in those situations, when somebody finally opens up and tells you what they're thinking, Mm -hmm. Um, it's not even a thing that was on your radar, right? Right. We're, right. We 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 go worst case scenario, yeah, yeah, catastrophize. We have, yeah, we actually have a, a program in our brain called the rumination mind, mm-hmm. and its job is to look for the worst case scenario. And we evolved with it. If you think about it as cavemen, mm-hmm. two cavemen would be standing outside of a cave. One of them had the start of this rumination program, mm-hmm. and the other one doesn't. So they both look at the cave and be like. Hey, that's dry. It's out of the, you know, the great place to go. But the one with the rumination brain would be, you know what? I'm going to be a little bit careful because there may be a bear in the cave. Maybe someone, other animal thought that that was a great exactly, hiding spot Exactly. As well. So, of course, who lived longer? Yeah. The one with the start of the rumination brain. Who mm-hmm. had more kids and now do their kids live longer? Yeah. Was this better rumination brain? Unfortunately, in today's day and age, that rumination brain isn't that good mm-hmm. because that's what we'll do is ruminate. We will think about problems that don't exist Mm -hmm. and make plans to solve them all the while you're still getting a stress response because you're visualizing bad things happening right so it's that whole catalyst that happens um when people start to make plans for something that's not real yeah and that's where the saying comes from plan for the worst or uh hope for the best but plan plan for for the the worst worst, yeah yeah makes sense um so what uh like was it when you left the police service was it like for lack of a better word frightening to be out in the world and like doing something completely new well it took me a long time to realize um because uh, in the job that i was in i worked some of the hardest zones and, and roughest districts mm-hmm. so i dealt with 10 percent of the population 90 percent of the time right and i honestly at that point um uh, didn't trust people uh, because I was like, everybody's lying to me all the time. Right. Um, yeah, I basically thought that everybody hated the cops just yeah. because my job had me around people that hated the that police. That did, yeah. Um, so that was one of the adjustments I had to go through is to realize uh, 
that 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 wasn't the norm. Mm-hmm. And it was actually I was up in Banff at a hot tub party, and it was getting a little loud. And suddenly the RCMP rolled up, and right away I was like, okay, who? out of this group of people I'm with is going to be the idiot because yeah. that's all I experienced in my life of course I was one right um, and it was great the RCMP rolled up everybody apologized everyone packed up their booze and the, the hot tub party was done and at that point that's where I had my epiphany of like oh I never really dealt with this side of the world for right. so long these are the 90% of the, uh, the world is awesome people that want to get along and that don't want to cause conflict mm-hmm. Uh, so that was one of the biggest things that I had to work through was uh, just starting to trust people again. Yeah. Right, so, what, like, what was your first plan of attack? Like, when you left, did you have the? Cause you, I think you went straight to Synovus. Yeah. 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 So, how like how did you get on with them, and and what you had uh, originally as a contractor? Um, so the I went. I knew that I was going to leave the police service. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I just took my time and started getting the education in place for me to do the transition. Mm-hmm. Uh, as well as that time, I was reaching out to connections that I had in the oil and gas industry. Right. And through those connections, um, I got my first placement. Uh, the unit was 400 workers. Um, and then I accelerated at that, had a huge passion for it. Mm-hmm. And then two years later, they uh, promoted me to another project, which was almost 4,000 workers. So uh, went from drinking from the fire hose, leaving the service, <laughs> to two years later, drinking from the fire hose again because yeah. it's such a large project. Yeah, that's unbelievable. And um, so what what do you attribute to, to skills you learned with the police force preparing you for the rest of your life? Like, Yeah, obviously dealing with people. Yeah. Um, it's really easy to deal with people when they're not high on crack or violent or mentally <laughs> unstable. I can imagine yeah, that. Yeah, right? yeah. So not as interesting, but easier. Yeah, and it's that whole idea of uh, a really good police officer just learns how to listen, mm-hmm. and that was it. Is is I learned that really early on in my career from my mentors. Is that if somebody's talking and you're already formulating an outcome, you're not listening. Right. You need to formulate your outcome at the end of everything that they've said. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the idea of being actively listening uh, is definitely being a huge asset. And then learning, too, about how um, we function with a conscious and subconscious level. And then I took all the stuff I learned in recruit training Mm -hmm. and massaged that into training for the oil and gas industry, and it was super successful over there. Yeah. So you just sort of took basic fundamental principles of... of being a successful, meaningful person, yeah. and brought him into this new career. Yeah, I think um, I think that's really lacking for a lot of people. They go to school and they get an education, it's like post secondary, but they learn all these like little skills and things, but they don't like take practical, like fundamental, almost philosophical knowledge. Right. I like the fact you're using the word of philosophical because the quote unquote rules that I developed that helped me accelerate in oil and gas, I don't call them that at all. Mm-hmm. I call them philosophies. Yeah. Uh, because if it's a rule, it's too stringent and it's not good for everybody. But right. at least with the philosophy, is that 10,000 foot view and mm-hmm. everyone massages it into what they need to use. Right? right. And a rule is only applicable to whatever game's being played, not every game, right? Exactly. You've always exactly. got different games going on. Life's yeah. a series of those games. So what are your philosophies? Do you have, is it like a, a, a tenant, like a set of them, or is it just... Yeah, so I function under the fact that everybody I meet, there's a reason for them to be in my world. Mm-hmm. So meeting you mm-hmm. right away, I look at it as what's the opportunity for me to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it actively gets me listening uh, with people. And then as well as in the now in the IT world, uh, still construction, um, I always work really hard to perceive it from that other point, person's point of view. Mm-hmm. Because I do a very specific niche in construction, um, whereas other guys will be very focused on production, very focused on quality, mm-hmm. and so we need to meld together to be efficient. Um, if I only take my world into account, I'm not going to be that in- efficient. Right. Uh, but if I take my time and listen to the other people I'm with, what's important to them, mm-hmm. um, then... I can massage what they need and what I need together. And, and uh, a lot of the initiatives I brought forward w- would reduce the amount of time it would take to deliver the information. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, there was a little bit of hesitation to the change. 
until you do the mathematics on what they want to see. So you show how much money they're saving in workable hours, mm -hmm. and then suddenly they see the numbers, and they're like, okay, let's do it. You right. know? But if I just would have pushed on my end, uh, that wouldn't have worked at all. So you're primarily in the safety side of things? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what does that mean? For all intents and purposes, like how would you, to a layman, how would you describe what it is that you do? Uh, so the the easiest way to understand the, the safety role is, of course, there's legislation and everything out there on, on what work sites need for fall protection and all that. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, what we call low-lying fruit. Basic uh, stuff. Pretty basic yeah. stuff. So what you want to do to have a really good culture on the site is you need to develop a group of guys and gals that are looking out for each other. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's two types of safety. One of them is what's called an interdependent. So they're just there to facilitate knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then the other type of safety we call is a bird dogger. Okay. So the guy who just watches and is like, do this, do that. Right. Uh, and my goal on all my sites is to get an interdependent site where my role is as a subject matter expert. So mm -hmm. if they're going to do a, a critical lift with a crane, I'll be part of the team. Right. Uh, but when I go out in the field, I want to see guys reminding each other yeah. and looking after each other. And the moment that you have that type of culture, it just works a lot better, even on the production and quality side, mm -hmm. because you have all these other subcontractor groups, welders, scaffolders, uh, pipeline guys, are all talking to each other instead of being in their own little uh, right. silos. And that conversation... If, the, if there's scaffold that needs to be built for a welder to go to work, if the welder talks to the scaffolder and says, hey, this is what I need to reach, yeah. it prevents a lot of rework. Yeah. Uh, the idea of preventing the rework makes the guys safer because the right it's getting built the right way the first time. Mm. Um, and then you'll see a huge increase on, uh, on your productivity. Your time on tools goes through the roof as soon as you have that culture in there. Right. Now, how do you, like, how do you convey the message that this is of, you know, utmost importance to people? Cause a lot of the times, like I've been on work sites before and, you know, safety is like not air quotes cool. Right. Yeah. It's just like, no, nah, no, nah, like I don't need to worry about that. Like, like what strategies have you developed to, to really get the message through? Yeah, so the, it's interesting because, of course, there's that whole safety first mantra out mm -hmm. there. And every project that I've taken, I will stand in front of a group of people and be like, okay, I'm going to say something that's going to shock you. Mm -hmm. But for me, safety's not first. Mm -hmm. Safety, quality, and production are all tied. It's all equal. Um, and then as soon as they understand that you're just not that bird dogger is when you can start... Really, at the end of the day, it's going to sound odd. You make them proud. Mm -hmm. You make them proud of of the type of work they can do. The, the fact that, like, scaffolders can build a magnificent structure overnight. Mm -hmm. and and But a lot of people wouldn't look at it the way I do, being like, that is amazing. They don't have the appreciation for exactly. it because it's not applicable to their life. Yeah, they so just... as soon as you start making them proud of what they can do, no matter what their role is, mm -hmm. uh, with that pride comes the idea of... of doing it professionally mm -hmm. and professional work is safe work at the end of the day right and so it's an ownership yeah. piece as well right yeah. making sure that they're they feel responsibility yeah. for it yeah like the first team i took over uh in the oil and gas the role with that team was actually really high risk it would be to go inside of a live plant mm -hmm. do repairs or shut down work not interfere with the production of the plant mm -hmm. so basically they, they need they needed to go in and go out without causing any other issues um, and when I got that team, the first thing I looked at him was like, you guys are like the Navy SEALs. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, come on, man. Like, you go behind enemy lines. You do what you need to do. And you come out and nobody even knows that you were there. Mm -hmm. um, and then as soon as you give them that, uh, that, that identity of being a specialist unit, mm -hmm. that's when that whole team took off. Like, they were oh, communicating better. Because, yeah. you know, you'd always draw that analogy of being like, you know, the, the, there's six guys in this, in this team. Mm -hmm. But each one has a different role. If you want to function like Navy SEALs, you all have to communicate your roles. Right. So as soon as they had that identity, they, they accelerated. And even uh, when I moved up to the larger project of 4,000, um, I looked at that group of people. I'm like, you guys are like the army. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I've never seen so much heavy equipment in my life and so much just the sheer size of your operations. Mm -hmm. And if you guys aren't coordinated with each other, this would fall apart. Right. 
So as soon as you start making people feel elite, they behave that way. That makes that yeah. makes a lot of sense. A little bit of flattery, a little bit of role play. Yeah, it's the same way. Like every young boy or girl grows up like role playing, right? Yeah. Playing, make believing. You want to be that that top notch performer yeah. in whatever field, right? And, and I think even if you look at like a sports analogy to it, is if you belong to the Olympic team, you're going to behave like an Olympian, right? Um, and then that's that's the idea. Even if you are in a professional team and suddenly you get taken from that professional team and you put into a very elite group, mm -hmm. people's skill levels will go higher just because they're proud and more dedicated to what they want to do. Right. Does it ever work the other way, though? And, and you take someone, you really, like, pump them up, and then they kind of almost get that entitlement? No, I haven't seen that happen, to be honest with you. the uh, With the idea of, of the flattery, is there if it's deserved right you know um in the construction world we call it a come to jesus meeting so if, you, <laughs> if you're making some epic fails yeah um it's never done in front of your peers mm -hmm. but it's definitely come in my office we need to chat and then right. you just simply tell them like hey we can't have this what's going on mm -hmm. a lot of times if you do a little data mining with people you'll see that there's other circumstances involved mm -hmm. that you can help them out with right whether they haven't been performing because they're going through a divorce. Right. And then at that point you can be like, okay, you know, let's, let's manage this. Yeah. Uh, let's give you some, some help and understanding. Right. right. Totally understand the next six months can be chaotic for you. Mm -hmm. So I'll partner you up with this other person, let them know how they can help you. Your past experience in the police force must be just absolutely vital when it comes to the, the people element of the job, right? Like just relating to and communicating with people, it seems so vital. Yeah, and even now, like because I manage teams of people, mm -hmm. um, the idea behind that is in the service I saw what a functional healthy team would do. Mm -hmm. And if you manage out of fear, uh, that's not a really successful process. I had sergeants that managed their team out of fear and punishment. Mm -hmm. But if the sergeant looked at us and was like, hey, I've got a one-way ticket to hell. Who wants to join me? They're standing by themselves. Right. But I also had the sergeants that managed the team out of respect and mm -hmm. fairness and courtesy. Mm -hmm. uh, we would have all lined up happily to follow him wherever he wanted to go. Right. So that's that whole idea of, of managing people. What's the morale of your of your team? What's the morale of your site? Because, you know, we we're talking about site culture. Um, if the morale is bad on site, nobody's talking to each other. They're fighting with each other. They're angry at each other. Like, it's horrible, and your productivity goes way down. Mm -hmm. um, if people don't trust each other on that site, you know, there's a great book out there called... Uh, building at the speed of trust and that fellow he gets contracted to go to companies to bring trust into the companies mm -hmm. because they've noticed a 20 percent on average increase in the productivity as soon as people trust each other right and it's not hard a trust is just basically a combination of, of uh, capability mm -hmm. are you capable to do the job and commitment so if i tell you hey give me that role i'll take it i'll do a good job at it mm -hmm. the moment you see me doing what I say I'm going to do, mm -hmm. trust starts to get built. Of course. Yeah. Accountability too, right? Like yeah. always doing what you say you're going to do. Yeah. And if you can't, then getting ahead of it too, right? And being like, look, I said this, but here's here's the problems right yeah. now. Let's say stand. And, yeah. And then even with that, that's where the whole team comes in, right? Mm -hmm. Some some people on the team, when I look at my teams now, I meet somebody and I look at what they're passionate about and what they're good at. Mm -hmm. And those are the things I will cultivate. I won't look at anything that they don't have a passion to do or that they're weak at. Where some of the philosophies are, oh, they're not that good at X, mm -hmm. so I'll get them to do more of X. Right. Where it's like, no, no, I want a rock star. Yeah. I got a team of rock stars. Specialized. And they're down, specialized. Like, yeah. right? like, this is this person's role. Mm -hmm. They love it. They're awesome at it. I will not ask them to do anything else. Yeah. How do you go about getting to know the people that you're, you're trying to lead and trying to structure together as a team? Uh, you know what? It's uh, in the beginning. It's just simple interactions, but oddly enough, breaking bread, yeah, one on one over lunch, mm -hmm. is the easiest way for barriers to come down. It doesn't feel so formal anymore. Um, you talk about their families, what they do for hobbies, and then you just I'm just straight up with them. And be like, what are you good at? Yeah. What do you love to do? And a lot of times they're in a role that they don't love to do it, and they're not that good at it. Mm -hmm. And then they'll mention a different role and be like, okay, I'm gonna cultivate the opportunity we'll transition you over 
and then they knock it out of the park. Right. Yeah. Well, especially they they know that they've been handed an opportunity that that they better make the most of. Yeah, right? and they've got heard. Mm-hmm. Right. A lot of people just um, so key feel heard. frustrated that yeah. their people aren't listening. Mm-hmm. Um, and the moment that you hear them, and that's a trust component. If if they tell me no, I'd much rather do this role, mm-hmm. and I look at them and say, you know what, I'll do what I can. Let's see if we can cultivate that. The moment I do that our efficiency goes up because they trust me. Right. And I trust them because they're going to perform for me. Yeah. Who are some of the leaders that, that you look up to that have influenced you? Do you have any specifics? Yeah, the uh, my firearms coach in the police service, he was a great mentor. He actually got me reading books on philosophy and all mm-hmm. that. And he was an interesting fellow because he was a big guy too, shaved head, really mean looking. Yeah. Uh, but super relaxed, very philosophical in his approach to life. So he got me into reading various books of philosophy. Um, and even as in a younger stage in my life, I'd have to say like mid-teens, uh, was I took karate, mm-hmm. and my karate instructor was very influential because he taught me just discipline. Right. Right. And, and I think that's a hard thing to learn unless you have the right mentor to be like, Mm-hmm. This is the way it is, and you need your Mr. Miyagi, right? Yeah, yeah. Just keep some discipline, right? Yeah. Well, it's J- Jocko Willink. Are you familiar with his stuff? Yes, very much. Discipline equals freedom. Yep. I think it's it's so important. It's so key, and like you're not taught that in life anywhere. Like you're kind of like you kind of broached it by people saying like make your bed by your parents or you yeah. clean your room but there's no underlying philosophical explanation as to why that's so important yeah. like get your get your inner life get your surroundings and your home in order before you go into the world and start trying to change other things well, too. absolutely and i love his outlook on it um where he starts off by being like people look at me because i'm so disciplined mm-hmm. feeling like i'm trapped yeah and he comes forward and he's like, my discipline gives me freedom. So even if you look at the fact of being disciplined and going to the gym or whatever every day, yeah. a lot of people would look at that and be like, well, you go to the gym for an hour every day, yeah. sucks to be you. It's a right? huge commitment. It's a huge yeah. commitment. And uh, But then you look at it and be like, yeah, but it gives me a freedom of my body. Mm-hmm. I can move easier. I can breathe easier. And it also gives me more freedom with my food. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I, eat, I eat pretty regimented six days a week, but yeah. my one day a week, my Sunday, <laughs> my binge day. Yeah. Um, last Sunday, I had an entire key lime pie for breakfast. Is that for breakfast? Yeah. On, yeah. So you have a whole cheat day? Yeah, a whole cheat day. I just sure. eat as much as I want all day long. What's right? your, Okay, so what's your eating and what's your workout regimen? Uh, you're, so, you're, you're a big guy. Yeah, so... Um, it's interesting. For the longest time, I used to eat every two and a half, three hours. Right. That that, uh, that was big for a while. Big for a while. And then I read um, a book by, uh, oh, his name will come to me. He wrote Tools of Titan. Oh, Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. Yeah. Uh, and he was talking about intermittent fasting. Yeah. So I'm always apt to experience something new. Mm-hmm. And even though the old way was working quite well, mm-hmm. But getting older now, I noticed that it was harder to keep the weight off. Um, so looked at intermittent fasting, did my own research. Mm-hmm. It made a lot of sense on an evolutionary standpoint because yeah. us as primitive people wouldn't have woken up and ate right away. Right. It just, that was not, we would wake up. You got to move. You got to kill something. Yeah, you got to get some food, right? right? Yeah. Um, so I started intermittent fasting six months ago. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Really? Absolutely. I thought it was going to be harder to go without food because mm-hmm. I was so conditioned to eat. Yeah. And even before that, I would only sleep maybe five or six hours and then I would wake up and I was waking up hungry. Right. As soon as I started intermittent fasting, I can sleep now full eight hours. Yeah. I don't wake up in the morning hungry. Um, that cup of coffee on an empty on an empty stomach really sets you off. Yeah, too, right? it's like so you, rocket fuel. Yeah, yeah, it definitely gets you supercharged. What's your window? What's your uh, your your feeding window and what's your fasting window? So I will have my first meal at ten a.m. Mm-hmm. and my last meal at uh, around four p.m. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. So that's pretty. That's eighteen hour fast. Eighteen hour fast. That's incredible. Yeah. And uh, like people struggle with getting to that point or getting close to that point too because like. They go, oh, I just not cut out for it. They're hungry all the time. But, like, they don't realize how much your body can adjust to it. Like, 
I eat pretty much every morning before I get up, or not before I get up, before I go go out the, out the house. But I know because I've gone through periods where I, I didn't do that before I go go to the gym. You don't get hungry. Yeah. Like your body gets conditioned to whatever you're telling it to. You just have to. You really do struggle for a week or two while yeah. you're adjusting. And and even on my end, I know how important that internal dialogue is. So when I first was reading about intermittent fasting, I was on that path, being mm-hmm. like, man. I have no idea. At like two and a half hours, I'm starving. Plus, you probably like food. Yeah, of like, course. Hey, I love to eat. <laughs> love to eat, right? You know, I uh, I always laugh where I'm like, I train to support my eating habit at the yeah. end of the day. And, but then when I heard that internal dialogue of me saying, oh, I don't know if I can do this because that I'm going to be hungry, yeah. right away it became a flag. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I do now with my internal dialogue is if I recognize that it's not a positive internal mm-hmm. dialogue, then you have to assess it. Right. <clears throat> and then change it. So what I did then was um, do the research and said, no, this makes sense. The human body is not intended to wake up in the morning and eat. Right. All the scientific evidence out there about how your growth hormone levels spike and uh, how all these other hormones in your body spike after 12 hours of no food mm-hmm. makes sense. And then I read some other people's comments about hunger and they're saying yeah in the beginning you're hungry for like 30 minutes yeah and then that's a 30 minute window goes and then it, the hunger dissipates yeah absolutely so when i first went down the path i changed my idea of like i can deal with 30 minutes of hunger mm-hmm. and you cultivate your 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 mind for it and it was super it was actually and i did it progressively so the first uh four weeks it was just 12 hours right yeah, a twelve-hour window, and then when I realized how easy it was, and there was times where I'd be at fifteen hours, sixteen mm-hmm. hours before I'm like, "Oh, I should really eat." Mm-hmm. Um, didn't lose any muscle mass because, of course, being a gym junkie, that was what I was worried about. Of course, yeah, uh, and I felt really good. So at the end of the day, I was like, "Okay, this is a good path for me." So you found that six hours, six and eighteen split is optimal for you. Yeah, that's where you feel the yeah. best. Yeah, and I tried to go over the eighteen because some people that do intermittent fasting will go two or three days. Right. As soon as I breach that 18 hours, I know uh, the memory isn't as good anymore. I get really tired and lethargic. So right away, you still have to listen to your body and just be like, no, this is not this is not where I want to be. Have you ever messed with keto? Uh, occasionally. When I was younger, I was into bodybuilding. Yeah. So the last six weeks would be the keto, the keto phase of things. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that was before, because it's like crazy popular right now. And I yeah. Know everyone's talking about it. It's, which, oh, no, it's been around yeah. forever, right? Yeah. It, it, everything's cyclical. So uh, what was popular 20 years ago is becoming popular again. Yeah. How do you find people, I'm going to jump all over the place. How do you find people um, react to you? Like you're obviously a big physically statured person. Do you have to tail your tail? tailor your approach um, depending on who you're talking to or are you very cognizant of that like how people are going to take what you say very differently from what a guy like I would say yeah no 100% um, especially you have to know your culture so in oil and gas uh, they're called roughnecks for a reason yeah. um, so your industrial English can be really you can be really fluent in it yeah uh, but on the same token, if I'm then transitioned to a corporate realm, I'm not going to use the same language. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, going to the IT world, uh, where culturally you have a lot of people that are just plugged into that machine, and they're they're geniuses, they're absolute savants at what they do, mm-hmm. but the social skills are lacking. Right. right. So you have to be cautious with them. Some of them don't like to shake hands, mm-hmm. so you even have to read that body language. Right. Um, but the biggest thing I do is when I meet people is uh, smile. Yeah. Right. If I don't, and it makes sense, right? If if you don't smile when you meet somebody right there subconsciously, you're telling them some really bad body language, mm-hmm. right? So I take my time and I smile, and uh, and it's that whole idea of, of yeah, just getting them to 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 meet me, right? To look past right. the tattoos and everything else and. Mm-hmm. It takes a little bit of time, but it, those are nice barriers to break through. As right. Well through. And I mean, it's not like you deal with it on occasion. It's, you live that reality all the time. Yeah. So you're probably very used to someone seeing you. And if it's an IT guy, maybe assuming like, oh, here's a meathead. Yeah. And you're like, no, I know how to deal with this because you read a lot, because you're articulate and well-researched. Like, it's probably pretty easy for you to break that down. Yeah, and I use it as an asset, right? Yeah. I'd rather have people underestimate what 100%. I'm capable of than, yeah. than overestimate, yeah. right? So... Uh, it's definitely a tool. I mean, if 
if I was uh, a super brain IT guy, mm -hmm. then that's a good tool to use with people, right? Yeah. Um, but on my end, uh, my size and all that has always been that, you know, even in uniform when I was policing, mm -hmm. you learn, yeah, you walk up to a group of people and you smile and you shake their hand, you get a way different result. Right. It. It's, yeah, it's so different, especially because it's almost unexpected, right? Yeah. You see a big intimidating person, you're like, oh shit and yeah. then they smile and you're like what is going on right yeah, now I'm exactly. so so weird yeah I profiled that person totally wrong yeah. right? because I thought they were going to be you know an asshole yeah but that's a great way to shake them out of those like those um, preconceived sort of systems that fire up yeah. right like we're we're so good at our automatic responses to things but sometimes they sabotage us yeah, sometimes some even like our interpretation of hunger yeah. well it's not because we're hungry or it's not because we physically need calories right it's because we're inundated with messaging 24 7 about eating it's because we've been structured to eat at breakfast lunch and dinner yeah and uh and so you know just because there are natural indicators doesn't mean that they're necessarily beneficial to us 100 even the idea behind hunger a lot of times you're not hungry you're thirsty yeah but we misinterpret the idea of thirst by wanting to stuff our face with stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, to understand where you're at and what you're portraying is, mm -hmm. is huge to your success. Yeah, even like emotional responses, I think, too. Like so often we're, we're supercharged and you look at what's going on in the States and you see, you know, Trump saying something inflammatory and, and we just like, we get really emotional about, or like, the gender neutrality is a great one, right? Because people get incredibly charged about it. Yeah. So even you get a guy like Jordan Peterson now talking very rationally, very scientifically about what, like about humans and how we are. And he's not ever saying that he agrees with some of the inequality or unequal distributions of things. He's just saying, no, these are why, and these are the theories behind why we are this way. Yet people label him a bigot and a transphobe and a sexist and a misogynist and all these things just simply because he's talking about them in a way that's not that's not apologetic. Yeah, right? and I think the thing is is that if you truly want to portray a message, ensure that you're not it's not an emotional message. Right. Uh, because I know myself, if I'm emotionally involved in a topic, mm -hmm. I'm not going to listen anymore. Mm -hmm. You you know perception is ninety percent of our own reality. So if if I go to meet somebody and I already have that wall up, being like, oh, I know what this person's going to be like, I'm going to miss out on that opportunity of, of learning something new. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, guess what? It's okay to change your mind. Right. You get educated and you're like, oh, hey. But our ego gets us so wrapped up in that, right? It's like you know you don't want to be wrong, and it's yeah. really hard to say I was wrong and I'm you know changing my opinion now. Yeah. Any strategies there, like? Uh, you know what? It's it's just educate yourself, and yeah, if you're arguing, a that's not the right way to communicate. Right. Um, B, if you're getting emotionally jacked, it's okay to look at the other person and be like, "Hey, I know we we're talking about Trump politics as an example, but he gets me really emotionally spiked." Yeah. Let's stop talking about it. Right. Or you just warn somebody, and if they bring a topic up that you are emotionally invested, if you just tell them, be like, hey, I'm really not going to be the best person to talk to. Yeah. Because if you disagree with my philosophies, we're going to have a hard time. Right? I can't control I can't I'm control myself. <laughs> exactly. And that's fine. It's, yeah. If that's where you're at, that's where you're at. Um, but that recognition and that understanding of yourself, that yeah. self-awareness, yeah. right? And then also when I'm speaking with somebody else, let's say you give me some instruction. Mm hmm at the end of a conversation, I will reiterate what I think you want. Right. That's a good and, tactic. And by doing that, yeah, you find out that, man, I was chilled and I was listening. I wasn't emotionally involved, yeah. but I still didn't truly understand what you needed. Right. And by reiterating and just being like, okay, Shane, so this is what you're going to need. And I list it out. Mm -hmm. If you say yes to all of them, we're good to go. Yeah. If, if not, we're not good to go and vice versa. If we're having a conversation, I'll ask you to. Because mm -hmm. some people don't have that skill. So after you've given an instruction to them, I always look at people and be like, okay, so what do I need out of this? Right. And lots of times they'll say, oh, this, this, and this. And you'd be like, oh, the first two, yeah, but the yeah. third one. Yeah, you got off. that wrong. Yeah. Well, not only that, but if you're re reiterating my beliefs, I might see the flaw in a logic because I'm hearing it now said by someone else versus myself. And I'm like, well, I know I said that, but you're, okay, that's not what I meant, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you get a lot of that. It's the whole idea is the moment that we put our thoughts onto paper, mm -hmm. it lets us visually see where we're at. And vice versa, if you're dealing with somebody 
and they're like, okay, so my understanding is you need this and this and this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, lots of times they'll be just like, oh, no, no, that's I, I only need this. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're bad at communicating, Yeah. right? We're yeah. really bad. And especially, like, most of communication is nonverbal yeah. anyway, right? And it was what we were talking about earlier about that rumination mm-hmm. mind. Um, it's there to always look for the worst-case scenario. So mm-hmm. it's also there to look for the worst-case scenario interacting with another human being. Mm-hmm. So it will never be. It will never read body language as positive. Yeah. Right? So it'll put us down that spiral of, you know, you know. Normally, John comes in the office and he's he wants to talk. He didn't talk to me today. <laughs> What's wrong? Yeah. And then it ends up being like, oh, I might as well put my shit in the box because he he's, he's right. going to fire me. Right? Yeah. And you're like, I'm just hungry. Where's my? <laughs> exactly. exactly <laughs> I, fa- right? I fasted too right? long. Yeah. Be like, all right, I'm uh, two cups of coffee for breakfast. Yeah. A little, little squirrely, right? Yeah. Well, it's like the worst case scenario, like male, male to male would be like, oh, he's probably going to try and kill me. Yeah. Like, and male to female is like, you're trying to talk to a girl, a pretty girl, and you're like, oh, she's going to embarrass me in front of everyone and turn me down or reject yeah. me or, or, you know, devalue me or something. Well, and that's a, almost never the case in, no. in either circumstance. No, and we, we, we always formulate the worst case scenario. And then when we drum up enough courage mm-hmm. to do it, it's never like that, yeah. right? And it's it's the whole idea, like even transitioning out of the police service into the oil and gas, was there fears and anxieties? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I prepared myself, and then I took the leap, and what I perceived was going to be the the hard parts about it wasn't that at all. It was, a, right. it was a nice, smooth transition, right? So did you see yourself being this internationally successful kind of when you were younger? Do you, do you think oh, you're meant for this? No, no. This? It's funny because up till, I think, 18 years of age, I was a uh, fat, long-haired Dungeons & Dragons kid. Come on. Yeah, are you serious? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. What the fuck happened? It, you know, it, all it did is... Uh, you know, honestly, it was was exercise. Pendulum swung the other way. Yeah, yeah. I uh, my brother had some weights in the basement, and naturally, I was a very strong kid. Yeah. Though, uh, so I started lifting the weights, and then bought a gym membership, and then suddenly realized what I could do. Um, and then, you know, martial arts changed my perception on what I could do. It gave me a lot of uh, discipline and structure. And the moment that you realize that you're truly limitless, yeah. the only person that's going to stop you from what you're going to achieve is you. Mm-hmm. And uh, as soon as you start having that attitude, like uh, I have a little post-it note on my computer that reminds me every day what I need to do. And the, words, the word that I put on there is thrive. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's ambiguous enough that if today was really hard and I just persevered through it, well, I'm still thriving. Right. right? If you put in there like, Fifteen million dollars on your post-it note. Well, that's pretty hard to right to measure, right? You need achievable goals, for yeah. Sure, yeah. But um, something you mentioned to me in your message: a lot of the times we sort of self-sabotage ourselves based on you know where we grew up or what we feel we're capable of. Like, you know, what's what's the message to people to to try and overcome that? Yeah, I've heard it a lot. Where when I'm here and I talk to a lot of my friends, and they all say, you know. Well, we're surprised that somebody from Edmonton is now working internationally and mm-hmm. speaking. Um, if you truly believe that you cannot achieve something, you won't achieve it. I like to call it subconscious sabotage. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the best example I have is if I put a piece of bo- uh, board on the ground that's 12 inches wide, 12 feet long, and I ask people to walk across it, mm-hmm. no problem. Right. Now I suspend that board 200 feet in the air between two buildings. Physically, nothing's changed. It's the same board. Yeah. But what has changed is our perception of success on this board. Right. And the moment that you perceive that you can't do it, mm-hmm. oddly enough, you're training yourself not to do it. And I saw it when I was big into downhill mountain biking. We'd pick a line. Yeah. Um, and if we were with somebody that was like, oh, you know, that turn looks really gnarly. And you'd be like, well, why? Oh, there's a good place to get your front tire caught. You know, go ass over tea kettle over the handlebars. We'd always be like, okay, and I didn't know what was happening then, but our the group of guys I rode with were like, okay, you go last. Right. And then we'd ride down and set up the cameras there because we were ensured that there was going to be an epic wipeout. Yeah. So this guy would wipe <laughs> out and he would actually look at us afterwards and be like, see, I told you that was going to happen. Yeah. Many years down the line, I learned how to brainstorm information. You're like, oh, you did that because you trained your brain to do right. that. If you have visualized clearing that, mm-hmm. being successful. Yeah. Um, he would have cleared it. And, you know, there's no reason why eight guys could ride down and only one guy wipes out, right? right. Um, so it goes with that, with with the idea of identity of self. If you're going to pigeonhole yourself and say, 
oh, I'm from northern Alberta, oh, my only role can be in oil and gas, you will actually sabotage mm -hmm. your ability to be successful. Right, and you'll act in ways according to that belief too. Yeah, right? yeah. and you won't, no matter what you portray, is if you see yourself as stuck, you're stuck. Mm -hmm. You know, and I like to use uh, the fellow that summoned Everest first, uh, Sir Edmund Hillary. Mm -hmm. Before he summited Everest, everybody that tried, they all said the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's a killer mountain. You cannot summit Everest and come back alive. Right. And people were actively dying on that mountain. But with him, that was not his core belief. Mm -hmm. So he summited and returned off of Everest. And the moment that he showed other people that could be done, mm -hmm. now it's a, just an extreme vacation holiday for people to go summit Everest, right? right? But before that, everybody sabotaged themselves, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and they, you don't do it on a conscious level, you do it on a subconscious right. level. Seeing someone succeed, having done it before is massive. That's why it's so hard to be a trailblazer, an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Because you really have to have that. It's interesting. You have to have like a slight bit of self-delusion, right? You have to be able to block out the reality and, and yep. delude yourself to to what you've seen and every every bit of evidence telling you otherwise like was it the four minute mile right like no one did it until someone did it and then hundreds of people, people did, did now thousands of people exactly. did exactly right? like, and then even Arnold Schwarzenegger puts it a good way his rule is beware the naysayers yeah. so the moment somebody says that you can't do it is the moment that you get excited by being like oh I will show you yeah. because nobody has done this before it's a great opportunity right um, You're on the right track. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So the idea of, of yeah, I know you said self delusion. Um, I think that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You yeah, have but, to be. It's like, the same way you reach any goal that that. You know, you're a you're a six out of ten, and you're hitting on the nine out of ten, right? Yeah. A little bit of self delusion <laughs> goes a long way. Yeah, exactly. And I'm, you know, <laughs> and if you look at all the 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 people out there, the large business that is out there, the the Amazon, the Google, the mm -hmm. Apple rewind history they all started in their garage mm -hmm. and I'm sure a lot of people came to them and said you're crazy you can't achieve this yeah. uh, but then look what they can achieve they created something that is totally new in this world yeah. and and really successful so the moment yeah the moment somebody tells me that I can't do something mm -hmm. is a moment that I look at it and being like okay yeah. you know I'll show you. I may be a big guy, but I can rock climb. And yeah, I got exactly. into rock climbing, yeah. right? I forget who said it, but it was somebody said, if I only, it was one of those successful CEOs, if I only ever did jobs I was qualified to do, I'd still be a janitor. Yeah. Right? It's always that you have to take a chance. You yeah. have to, same with human interaction. Every time you talk to someone or you have an interaction, you're taking a chance, you're risking offending them because your beliefs don't line up or, you know. There's, it's just inherent in yeah. life. Life is struggle, and you have to risk in order to get out of that struggle yeah. or to improve your situation and get to the next struggle. Yeah, and it's, and I think that keeps life interesting, right? It's uh, boredom is my nemesis, mm -hmm. and um, always to look at, yeah, when when Google had hunted me to go work over in South America, if I listened to myself doubt, I wouldn't have taken it. Right. If I wanted to stay comfortable, I had a great job. I could have mm -hmm. stayed comfortable. But I looked at it as like, there's a huge opportunity here. I know what my work ethic is like. It's not going to be easy, but I know that I'll perse persevere through it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's that whole idea of uh, just stay on your path and, and understand that you, all you really need, I don't know any lucky people in this world. I just know people that work hard. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. If you think they're lucky, you didn't see all the hard work that went on behind it. Exactly. So it sounds like you, uh, you're you well on your way to having the subject matter for your second book already. Yeah. <laughs> Is that in the works? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm in the process of writing. So the presentation I do that's really popular is called The Power of Don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I'm just writing out all the philosophies, all the tools um, about how the conscious and subconscious mind, basically everything that I've been creating. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm putting it on paper uh, as well as uh, started a YouTube channel up showing my presentations on there um, so the 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 message will be easier to to share yeah right um, and I also look at it like they're life-changing philosophies that happened to me right so it's like presenting for the first time at a PTSD conference mm -hmm. if I can just change one other person 
awesome. Right. And, but we can't do that if we don't share what we're learning. Mm-hmm. Not only that, but it helps you reconstitute everything you believe in and, and makes you even more effective at demonstrating your own principles, right? yeah. that accountability piece. As oh, soon yeah. as it's in a book and you've given talks about it, you're you're beholden to it. You have yeah. to adhere to it. We're so I, part of our, our biology is to, or our psychology rather, is to act in accordance with other people's views of us. Yeah. So, you know, as we as we start to become known for things, if you're known as the big smart guy who gets shit done, you start behaving more and yeah, more like yeah. that, right? Yeah. Or, you know, if we even see it in the, in the entertainment world. Yeah. People that go on there, if people are portraying them as the out of control rocker. Yeah. It's just, that's where they go. Eminem, I am whatever you say. Am, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That was a deep song. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what's next for you? Like, I mean, short term, but also long term. Uh. I don't make long-term goals anymore. Okay. Life is just way too dynamic. Yeah. Um, all my my personal philosophy is is I just want to keep learning. Mm-hmm. So um, take courses online, do things that make me feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, past that, I don't put a timeline. I learned that in the service because right. originally my timeline was 25 years. Right. And I got that done in 15. So. Yeah. What's uh, what's a subject matter, sort of a, uh, an industry or field that you haven't yet approached, but you're planning to or you want to, you're curi- curious about? Um, I would like the public speaking part of my career to be full-time. Yeah. Um, but past that, I'm cultivating myself to simply be in like the, the senior level project management mm-hmm. role. Because I just love to see a group of people that are excited to be at work. Mm-hmm. And get shit done. That's the best feeling. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Everyone likes to watch someone who's good at their job, right? No matter what their job is. Basket weaving, fishing. As long as they're awesome. As long as they're great and they love it, right? Yeah, yeah. Will you break into uh, overseas at any point with your your work? Tackling a different culture? Because you seem like you've got the North American style down, but like throw a Chinese culture in there and that's it. What's interesting is is I've spent uh, my first time with Google in South America. Yeah. So dramatically different culture. Okay. Um, it made me realize why North America is an industrial giant mm-hmm. because we have a huge group of skilled laborers with an amazing work ethic. Mm-hmm. Um, to the point, I think it's really far left on the pendulum. Like mm-hmm. We're all about work. Yeah. South America, um, they don't have as large of a group as a skilled labor force. Mm-hmm. And yeah, everything there is manana. Right? <laughs> so... Um, so it was exciting for me to go there with these philosophies that I created that worked in North America to be mm-hmm. like, I wonder how this is going to work in South America. Right. Uh, having that there, giving them that pride, that a sense of a sense of elitism, mm-hmm. and then also finding which guys and gals fit which roles better. Yeah. The moment that happened, the productivity on that site skyrocketed. Right? For sure. Um, and then you just saw a lot more happy people because right. they're. Uh, the idea of somebody belonging to a different class structure moving up mm-hmm. is an anomaly. Where I didn't right. care what class structure people were at. Mm-hmm. Be like, Bob does a great job with the guys. Mm-hmm. I don't care that he's from a lower class structure. While he's working on this site, right. I'm going to promote him. And then as soon as everybody on that site saw that the doors were wide open, you then the high performers mm-hmm. became amazing people that's super interesting so you've got to go in and obviously respect the culture but to a degree sort of not respect it in the yeah. sense of like look if you want to get shit done like here's what it's going to take yeah you have to realize your sphere of influence yeah. um so there's no way outside of of that work project that i would try to influence their culture right uh and then you can also use their culture because in south america the the dudes do have a machismo to them, right? Mm-hmm. So as soon as what's that mean, machismo? Is that macho? Yeah, okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they 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 have that identity of of, of being mm-hmm. macho, yeah, uh, which is awesome. Either you could butt heads with them, or you mm-hmm. could just be like, oh, okay, this is a really good tool. Yeah. If if I have this group of guys over here and this group of guys over here, and I get them to have a healthy competition, right? They're going to accelerate, right? right? Um, and with that machismo is for sure you you praise in public, punish in private. You yeah. don't want them to lose face in front of their friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's all those things. But yeah, on the site, it was easy to be like these six square city blocks. Mm-hmm. This is North America. Here are the rules. Right. Off the site, you definitely have to adjust and just be like, no, I can't change their their culture. Yeah. Right? 
Well, that's super interesting. Um, sounds like a fun challenge. So coming back to North America must have been a bit more like, all right, I, I know what where the world stands. Yeah, it was America. it was definitely a, a blessing, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's it's. Did I like the South American culture? Yeah, like their idea of family mm-hmm. is is huge. Um, I think if we met in between, if there was like <laughs> between enough. North and South America, yeah. It would be good. But so you yeah. need to import some of those Latin Latin folk. Yeah, just to educate us on how to actually stop working. Right. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so where can people find you, learn more about you? Uh, so just through my website is www.johnbricks.org. Or if you Bricks in, is B-R-I-X. Correct. Yeah. Bricks is B-R-I-X. Uh, if you just do John Bricks on YouTube, um, I don't have a lot of content right now. I'm just in the process of building it. Yeah. Um, I, the people can find me on there also. That's awesome. Are you on Instagram or Twitter or any of that? No, stuff? you know it's funny. I'm not a social media not guy. Not a social yeah, media I guy. Yeah, I went through the phase of Facebook, and um, the thing is, with any new technology out there, we have to learn how to manage it. Yeah. So, and you've seen the ebb and flow where Facebook first came out, and then everybody wanted as many friends as possible. Yeah. And then people felt overwhelmed, so they're just like, "No, I'm going to cut this down to like." Five from 500 friends. People I've mean, actually met in real life more yeah, than once. Right? Yeah. And, and, but then Instagram took over that idea of just mm-hmm. getting as many followers as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like to read and do a whole bunch of other stuff than spend yeah. time on a social media site. So, so you, LinkedIn is the only social LinkedIn one. is my only That's social effective. media. That's effective. Yeah, because it's amazing. You can reach almost anyone nowadays yeah. like yeah. through one of those platforms. Yeah. Like the people that I've talked to, like when I, I went over to China in January, I was like, I was making introductions for myself to like GMs of big arenas and things like that. Just sending a message on LinkedIn okay. yeah. or like, you know, the directing managers of uh, social media companies and things like that. Yeah. It's, and like you found this podcast, I yeah. think it's, uh, that's pretty awesome. Well, I appreciate your, Thank time, you your time and uh, thanks so much for joining us. And I know people are going to really enjoy this episode and, Perfect. um, and look forward to watching your progress. Same. All right. All right. Thanks, thanks. Sean. That's a wrap on another episode of the podcast. I just want to reiterate how cool I think it is that John found me and we ended up meeting and doing an episode just based off LinkedIn. So if you guys have anyone you think is worthy of being on the show, please don't hesitate to send them my way. Other than that, hope you all have a great week and see you next time.